This is Tim Vasquez, and we're going to talk about a very interesting storm from the 1990s, what we would call kind of a freak storm. Watch this area right here on the visible satellite photo. You see a little cloud activity up there in northern Can or in central Kansas. Let's roll it forward from about, uh, let's see, we're about 11 a.m., 12 p.m., and look at that. We see the storm diving down through the, I guess, uh, Medicine Lodge to Enid area, and it ends up right here around the Lahoma area. This storm came through about 2.50 p.m. It produced sustained winds of 78 miles per hour for five minutes. Some of the gusts reached 113 miles an hour. And this is an estimated, or from some hobbyists out there, this is actual Mesonet equipment that measured these gusts. So this was quite a storm. Some of the residents said they received little or no warning. They ran to seek shelter in convenience stores, cellars, or any place they could find shelter. The hail was said to have piled up at least three inches deep, and it stripped metal siding from the mobile homes in that area. So how did this happen? We'll start out looking at the upper level charts. Here we have the 500 millibar chart. This is up at about 18,000 feet, the mid-levels of the troposphere. And this is pretty typical for late summer. This shows an upper level ridge across the western U.S., basically the Rockies, and an upper level trough across the Mississippi and Ohio River Valley. We're under the influence of high pressure for the most part. See this high pressure zone right here? We have clockwise winds around that upper level high. But we do have this area of northwesterly winds coming in from uh, Colorado and Wyoming. Not very strong at all, just 20 knots there at Oklahoma City and Dodge City. However, if we do go up to 200 millibars, this is up at about 39,000 feet near the top of the troposphere. This shows a little bit different picture. We have an area of strong upper level winds coming in, and this certainly qualifies as an upper level jet. So if I draw that out, see that right there? That's a polar front jet right there. See this uh, green contour here? This is, uh, these are ice attacks. So we have 30 knot winds right here. We have 50 knot winds right there. So across our target area, which is Wichita down Oklahoma City, we see this area of stronger winds nosing in. And this is kind of instrumental in helping shear, provide uh, some bulk shear for that storm. Getting 60 to 70 knot winds coming into that area. And if we draw out the storm, say that this is the ground right here, and we draw out a storm here. The lower levels of the storm are moving relatively slow, but the upper level part of the storm is moving very quickly. So you can picture this tower leaning over and the precipitation falls out and it's carried quite a distance from the cumulonimbus cloud as the precip falls out. So that keeps it from interfering with the updraft in this, this storm right here and it helps sustain it and give kind of a long lived structure to that storm. And that's what we're seeing here with this particular pattern. And here's the sounding for Oklahoma City. This is basically a plot with height of temperatures and winds. See right there showing OUN, actually that's Norman. And that's a 12Z, so that's going to be about 7 in the morning. What does this show us? Very weak winds at the surface, becoming northwesterly aloft. There's 20,000 feet right there. As we go higher, 30,000 feet, we start picking up the stronger up-level winds. See, so there's 50 knots right there, and we know that there's stronger winds up to the northwest. Looking at stability, you might uh, look at the stability parameters right here. You might see surface-based Cape Zero, mixed layer Cape Zero, MU Cape Zero, lift and index positive four, 
hey, that all that sounds great. It looks like there's no probability for any storm activity. But we have to remember that this is uh, 7 in the morning. We haven't even introduced the factor of solar heating. So those initial values you get off the morning soundings are not representative. What you have to do is you have to modify the sounding. And I'm not going to get too much into too much detail on this. But suffice it to say that if we pick a surface temperature of 95 Fahrenheit, which is indeed possible in, in August, and we modify the sounding, raise that up like that, we'll just assume that the parcel of moisture is going to remain about the same. So I'm going to construct a line like that. And I'm, again, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but what this tells me is we're going to get a final sounding like that. Still not a whole lot of instability. We would look at this for the positive area. We would look at uh, this for the capping. And all, all it would really take is a little bit more moisture from another source to maybe crank that up a little bit, get more instability. So we would look at the uh, low-level parameters of moisture, look at the uh, dew points that are upstream at the surface and uh, 850, and we would try to build a picture and see if that uh, instability would increase during the day. Apparently, things did come together, so there's no question that we got uh, good parameters for the storm here, but this is how it looked during the morning hours. So what happened at the surface? This is the 15Z chart, so this is, a, this is about 10 in the morning. And you can see that there's southerly flow coming up from Texas. It's bringing moisture up from the, the south. Dew points are not all that high for late August. We would normally expect to see upper 60s and low 70s. And what we have here is more like 60 to Oklahoma City and 62 there at Enid. So the moisture is a little bit on the low side, certainly. As far as the pressure field, I can draw a few quick lines here, like where the 30 zero, 0 contour would go something like this. Again, I'm just sketching through this really quickly, and I can't draw too well with a mouse, but there's 30 zero, 0 3005. Actually, there's 30 zero, 0 there. 3005 is going to go something like this. Carry that down to Texas. 3005 coming back like that. 3010, and overall this shows some fairly weak uh, pressure patterns here. But if we follow that along, we're going to find kind of a low pressure area in western Kansas right about there. And in between this 3005 in Amarillo and the 3005 in McAllister, there's kind of a trough indicated through here. Don't quite know if that's a front or what, but there is some sort of trough, could be a boundary, we don't know for sure. But this is important because this could be a favored area for development because when you have a trough, you tend to bring the air together like this. So that convergence adds mass to the lower part of the atmosphere and you get a slightly enhanced probability of storms forming in or near that trough. But as we can see, there were already storms going that, that day. See that uh, thunderstorm symbol right there? That's uh, either Hayes or Russell, Kansas. So we can already see that going on, and we know from the surface charts, running that back, yeah, you can see that thunderstorm activity up there in central Kansas. So that's going to become a factor as the day goes on. So I'm going to switch back to digital atmosphere. This is uh, plotted here with Global Surface Archives. goes all the way back to the 1940s. And I'm going to go over here and open the file menu for that. I'm going to go to Import Specific File. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the data for 18Z real quick. This would be about 1 p.m. So we open that, plot a new map, and look at how things have changed. So what did happen here? Well, I'm not going to go and sketch all these contours and all that, but we know that there is low pressure in northwest Kansas. There it is right there near Hayes. 
and I'll just plot the 30, 0, 0 line. Actually, that goes further south like that. There's another 30, 0, 0 line, goes something like that. 29, 95. So, yeah, there's the trough. It's still hanging in there from about to Great Bend down to Enid and down to Ardmore. So that's our favorite area. How is the moisture improved? That's very important for that sounding. I'm not going to go in and modify the sounding and do all that stuff. But we can see that the lower dew points that we had earlier in the day have come up a bit. There's the 70. See that right there? 70 there at uh, Fort Sill. So some higher dew points are on tap and they're kind of coming northward through that trough. Little tongue of 66, 67 dew points there. That's going to be really good for that storm that's diving south out of the Great Bend area and coming down towards Enid, kind of intercepting that uh, low level moisture and sweeping it up and getting some good uh, towers and CBs going there. So here's what the radar looks like. This is back in, again, 1994. Hard to believe we've had this kind of cool radar back in those days. But we've got the very basic beginning of the thunderstorm. This is at 12.05 p.m. We're uh, just northeast of Pratt. So what do we see here? Well, the storm has a very distinct bow-type structure. See that right there? That's kind of a, kind of a bow-shaped appearance with a notch in the back. That's indicative of an outflow dominant storm, uh, one with a very strong outflow, very strong downburst type signature. So there's probably some strong winds ahead of that, like that. Now we can't really use the velocity to, ch to check that out because the problem is the, if we switch over to velocity, the radar is, is over here. Let me try that one more time. See right here? That's the radar site. The radar is looking at the storm this way out to the west. The problem is it only measures movement to or from the radar. It doesn't measure movement side to side of air parcels. So right there, right away, it's going to have some difficulty measuring the uh, gusty winds coming out of that storm, which will be blowing mostly to the south. So we are a bit uh, handicapped as far as that goes. We might be able to pick up a little bit of outflow from here. Let's take a look at that real quick. What I, let me uh, shrink this window, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. You see down at the very bottom of the panel, uh, let's see, yeah, right down here, that's the cursor readout of velocity. So if I set that over here, I can see that there are uh, 10 to 15 knot winds coming out of that part of the storm. In fact, let me put a little dot right here. This is probably where the outflow on this side is. If I switch over to velocity, I'm getting a not really any particularly strong velocities, like maybe, yeah, 10 to 50 knots. So we're not seeing a whole lot here. There's a strange little signature along the leading edge right here. I'm going to switch over to de-alias to... Yeah, it's hard to see what's going on here. It's showing 70 knots outbound. That's probably just kind of some sporadic echo. In fact, if I go up to 1.4, that goes away. So that's probably just some sort of artifact right there. So moving forward, what happens? It uh, moves pretty quickly south. And then there's a gap in the uh, data. And it takes on a little bit of a triangular shape. You see that right there? Kind of like that. Some evidence maybe of a very, uh, very vague appearance of a supercell. The storm is kind of going through some transitions. And as it moves south, we kind of see it bouncing between that and an outflow dominant character. See right there? Now you see that bow shape return with a little bit of that notching in the back. As far as velocities, what are they up to? See, it's already crossing in Oklahoma there, and we're now at uh, 1841Z, that's 1.41 p.m. Not seeing a whole lot in the way of velocities. If I zoom that in there, the readout shows about 10 to 15 knots, 21 knots outbound, but remember, this is movement to and from the radar. 
We're not seeing that critical movement north and south where we would expect to find the higher outflow. And as far as uh, the Vance Air Force radar, that's not going to be up for another three months. So they just uh, barely missed that. All we have to go on is the Wichita and the Oklahoma City radar, and neither one of them are painting out the situation here very well. Okay, now we're going to take a look at the storm from the Oklahoma City radar, which is just a little bit down to the south. So we're looking at the storm from that direction, radar to the south-southeast. And we're about, uh, looks like, 100 miles from that radar. So what do we see here? Pretty much the same sort of pattern, kind of a outflow dominant appearance, and also kind of a slight supercellular signature with a flying eagle, a bit of the higher reflectivity on the south side of the storm, a bit of a cyclonic appearance, cyclonic curvature, and a little bit of what looks like a inflow notch or what we would call a weak echo region. If we go up to higher tilts, remember I'm, what we do is we look down here at the bottom of the screen. This is 10,000 feet up where the cursor is. No, actually 20,000 feet where the cursor is. And we go up to higher tilts. Now we're up at about 40,000 feet. And there's the top of the storm right there. I'm going to just ignore that and drop down one more level. And I'm going to drop a dot right there. See that marker right there? That indicates where the top of the storm is up at about 40,000 feet. How does that compare with what's at the surface? That's right over that notch. See that right there? Inflow notch. That's also the updraft base, weak echo region. So we're pretty far away right now, but that corresponds to the weak echo region. In fact, if I draw a 3D diagram across there, you can kind of see that. It's not, it's not like a textbook signature, but you can kind of see the overhang. See the precept right there kind of overhanging a weak echo region. And that kind of suggests that maybe there might be a weak echo region in here. We don't know for sure, but that's kind of what's going on there. There's the inflow coming into the storm and then rising up in this area here. So what do we have for velocities? Switch over to base velocity. Remember, base velocity is ground relative. So what do we have here? If I sample the winds and look down at the bottom, I'm seeing an outflow of about from the radar at about 10 knots. When I see this red, I'm talking about outbound velocities, so air is moving this way away from the radar at about 10 knots. On the other hand, the green or cool shades, those indicate inbound velocities going towards the radar. Those will have negative velocities in this readout down here. So we've got winds coming toward the radar at 42 knots, winds going out at uh, 9 knots. Now one thing that we have to keep in mind is that we have not factored in storm relative motion. So we're looking at this from a ground relative framework. If we want to look at this from a storm relative framework and find important rotational signatures, couplets and that kind of thing, we want to factor in that storm relative motion. So we take into account where the storm is moving from. We know it's moving north, northwest to south, southeast at about 30 knots, maybe 25, 30. So we'll go ahead and plug this in over at the set storm motion table. So I'll type in 340 at 25. Then I'll switch over to storm relative velocity. Now it's a little more balanced. The outbound velocities are kind of excessive, so I'm going to drop that back just a little bit. Maybe 15 knots. Yeah, that's a little better. And what it's showing is that we don't really have any rotational couplets. And by that, I'll have to show you a little bit later. I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but most of what this is showing is just kind of a balanced inflow outflow structure. So moving ahead. Storm barrels south, and La Homa is located right there. That's the 
spot that's going to be hit in about 30 minutes. So the storm progresses south, getting a little closer to the radar, so we're picking up a little more of the structure. There's that weak echo region right in here, seeing that vague supercell shape here. And there's La Homa right there in the sights of that storm. And let me zoom in a little bit. How does the velocity signatures appear? Well, right now we have a lot of range folding going on. That's where the radar can't discriminate between all the different pulses it's sending out, and it can't really map the uh, train of echoes to where they would be on the display. So that tends to junk up the velocity like we see here. We can overcome that to a certain extent by using another radar, which we really don't have or going to higher tilts. And now we're seeing a little bit of something going on here. What we have here, remember we're only looking at components to or from the radar, not side to side. So what I see here is maybe a little bit of motion away from the radar. This is ground relative. Motion toward the radar here, motion toward the radar. Or, I'm sorry, <laughs> other way, other way, other way. So a little off low there. How does that compare? Well, this is probably suggestive of maybe a little bit of cyclonic rotation in here, a little bit of outbound velocity here. It's really hard to tell. And here we've got some, uh, the de-aliasing algorithm has failed here. The storm is pretty far away and it's embedded in all that range folded stuff. So we'll go forward another frame. You can tell the forecasters really had their work cut out for them. Storm has now taken on kind of a supercellular structure, and now it's just about on the town. Base velocity, now we're starting to see a little bit of something here. I'm going to switch over to storm relative. And that shows that we have outbound velocities in this area and inbound over here. What's the magnitude? Well, we're seeing about 27 inbound, about 38 outbound. This is still pretty far from the radar, so we don't know what for sure what's going on as far as tornadoes or anything like that. But we do know that there is definitely some sort of meso in here, mesocyclone, and the center is about right there. And what I'll do is I'll set a dot right there. How does that compare with base reflectivity? That's about where we would expect the hook. If we were able to see a hook, it would probably look a little bit like that. But again, we're just kind of speculating based on the data we have available. We can qualify that to a certain extent by going up to higher tilts. Base velocity not showing a whole lot. Remember, this is ground relative. However, in this mess here, let me put de-aliasing back on. We can see that there's inbound velocities of about 37 to 40, maybe some 62 here. But this is about 8,000 feet off the ground, so we don't really know what's happening right at the ground because we're so far away. As far as other signatures, we can go higher up into the storm. And you can see that core, that upper level core, just about right over the overhang area. So I'll set that dot right there. And you can see it's right over this, this uh, inflow notch right there. So a very classic uh, supercell type structure very coarse, but yeah, it's, I'll do the 3D structure so you can kind of check that out. There it is, look at that, look at that overhang right there. Inflow coming in here, going up somewhere in here, rising, producing precip, and then getting lofted out downstream, out this way. So a lot of the big weather is happening right in here, and we probably don't have a tornado on the ground, but certainly probably pretty strong meso in here, and I think it's probably lofting a lot of hail around the backside and towards La Homa. There it is right there, unlucky La Homa, about to get clobbered. So the storm is just about on them, it's uh, 2.45, and now they're really getting the, the damage right there. So you got 71 dBZ echoes. Not a whole lot from the base velocity since we're about 7,000 feet up, but we are picking up 67 knot winds. That's probably about 75, 80 miles an hour. And certainly, yeah, there could be some heavier stuff on the ground. There's 70 knots, that's about 80 miles per hour. So pretty good uh, rear flight downdraft error 
smashing into them. This is uh, this is actually a textbook supercell that came right through there. Good, strong rear flight downdraft. And that gives us the Lahoma Storm, and you've seen it right here, all broken down for you. So we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap that up now and uh, get this video uploaded. If you have any questions or comments or want to discuss the situation, feel free to write that in there in the YouTube comments. And we'll try to do a few more of these and take you back through some of these historical situations. Anyway, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.